Hi, welcome to this tutorial video about the basics of Microsoft Excel. In this video, we'll begin by looking at the actual worksheet screen itself, so you can learn where the different tools are that you need. Then we'll look at doing data entry to a worksheet. We'll learn about entering text or numeric values, and we'll also learn some simple basic formulas. Along the way, I hope you feel you get a lot of good tips and tricks from me. Some important details for you to keep in mind. All worksheet data that you enter in, that you type in, is either going to be text or a value. Values come in two kinds. Values are either constant values, that's a number, just a number that you type into a worksheet, or variable values. And variable values are calculations that are based on the numbers that you typed that are your data. Constant values don't change unless you go back to that cell and either delete or edit it. A variable value will change depending on what's happening with your data on the worksheet. Important keystrokes for you to keep in mind. First of all, all formulas must begin with an equal sign. Without an equal sign, Excel won't calculate it. It'll just treat it as if you've typed a phrase or a sentence into a cell. The caret, that little up pointing arrow, is used for exponents. So for instance, if you typed 4 caret 2, that would be an indication of 4 to the second power. A forward slash is for division. An asterisk is for multiplication. A plus sign is for addition. And a hyphen is for subtraction. All of these things follow the same order of precedence that we learned in junior high school. So if you have a complex formula, any exponents would be calculated first. Then either division or multiplication would come next. And then finally, adding and subtracting happens last. And if you need to change that order of precedence, then we do it the same way we did it with a pencil and paper. You would surround the priority calculations with parentheses. So let's go take a look at Excel. I am working in the Microsoft Office 2016. So that's the screen that you're looking at. When you open up Microsoft Excel, much like when you open up Word, you come to a home screen that has templates across the top. And then down below, there are lists of files that you've been working in recently. What I want to do is open the new blank workbook template so I can start from scratch with my budget worksheet. So I'll click on that. And here I am in a Microsoft Excel workbook. Now I want to point out the different parts of the screen to you. At the top, with all, as with all Windows programs, we have a title bar. And once we name our work, where it says book one right here, eventually we're, we will get the name of our worksheet showing there once we start to save our work. Over at the left side of the title bar, we have what's called the Quick Access Toolbar. And by default, it comes with a Save button. It comes with an Undo button. It says Can't Undo, but that's because we haven't done anything yet. There's nothing to undo. And we also have a Redo button. And notice it says Can't Redo, but that is also because you can't redo anything until you first undo something. But those are the buttons that come on your Quick Access Toolbar. You can add other buttons there if you want to. Uh, if you have commands that you use really frequently, you can put a button up there for them. Underneath the title bar, we have the ribbon. As you already probably know, the ribbon is broken into tabs. The tabs are broken into groups. So for instance, on the Home tab, I have the clipboard group, the font group, the alignment group, et cetera, et cetera. The groups contain command buttons that sort of go together. So in the font group, I have all the buttons that have to do with changing font or color or font size, things like that. Underneath the ribbon, there is this area here that's horizontal area that's really important. It's called the formula bar. And the formula bar is broken into three pieces. On the left side, we have something called the name box. The name box tells you where you are. And at the moment, that might seem like a no-brainer because I can see that I'm at the top row of column A. I'm at A1. So yeah, that's easy, Betsy. I can see that by myself. But if I click way down here, 
and ask you, where am I? The fastest way for you to know where I am is to look in the name box. Because otherwise, if I just look down here and I look at my selection indicator, I won't know where I am unless I look up at the Q, and then I come over here, and I look at the row number, and I go, OK, that's Q25. Whereas the name box just tells me immediately. It's much easier. And knowing where you are is critical in Excel. Everything is about location. So this is a really an important tool. To the right of that, we have two buttons that are currently grayed out because we haven't done any work just yet. The X and the check mark come alive when we start to type. For instance, I'll just type a few letters there. Notice that the X suddenly springs to life. And it's called the cancel button. It's sort of like the escape key on your keyboard. I think of it as like an oops button. Um, the X would be used if you start to type and you suddenly realize that you're in the wrong place or you're typing something you didn't mean to type. The X will undo what you're typing. The check mark is called the enter button. And that's like pressing your enter key, except that you don't move. And there are some times when that's really handy. For now, I'm going to click the X because I don't know, need that SDF in that cell. So I'll click the X, and it goes away. To the right of that, there's something called the Insert Function button. And we're not going to learn that in this tutorial. In more sophisticated uses of a worksheet, this is a really handy tool to know about. But we're not going to worry about it in this tutorial. To, r to the right of that is something, this is the actual formula bar. And the formula bar shows you cell content. These boxes down here are called cells. Wherever a column and a row intersect is a cell. And the formula bar shows you cell content. We don't see cell content down here necessarily. What we see in the worksheet area are results of what we type. But sometimes what we see as a result is not the same as what we actually typed into a cell. When we get to that point, I'll, point it, I'll be sure to point it out to you so that you understand what I'm talking about. In the worksheet area, we have rows and columns. Now, at the moment, the worksheet has what? Maybe, what is that, about 12 or 15 columns, and we've got about 25, 27 rows visible. And that looks like a pretty nice size to be working with. But the worksheet itself is gigantic. It's way bigger than this. An actual Excel worksheet has 16,385 columns, and it's got 1,048,576 rows. The entire size of the worksheet is gigantic. Um, but we're going to work just in this small um, corner area in the upper left corner of the worksheet. But be aware that some worksheets can get really big. Although, to be honest with you, you could probably never fill one of these worksheets yourself because most of us don't have computers with enough memory to hold that much data all at once. But some people who work in maybe government offices have really big spreadsheets, and they might need them that big. OK, so let's start building a spreadsheet. Now, I've already mentioned to you that there are two kinds of data. There is text, and there are values. So let's deal with our text first. I will click at A1, and at A1, I'm going to type a title. Um, I thought that for this particular budget, we would pretend that we are running a homeless shelter. That that's my job. I'm the director of a homeless shelter, and I need to build a budget based on last year's data. So I'm going to build a three-month or a one-quarter of the year budget based on some data from a previous year. I'll type my title at the top. So downtown homeless whoop, shelter proposed budget. Maybe I'm going to go to a board meeting, and I want to take this to a board meeting to share with the board members. When I press my Enter key, that does two things. Pressing my Enter key finalizes the entry, and it moves me down to the cell below it. I want you to notice that when I press my Enter key also, it looks like this title is in A1 and B1 and C1 and D1. 
But notice that when I click on A1, it shows me in the formula bar that that is my cell content. If I click on B1, that's an empty cell. C1, that's also an empty cell. What I typed went into A1, even though it spills over to the right to take up whatever room is necessary in the cells on the right side of it. For one second, I'm going to just type my own initials. Maybe at C1, I'll type my initials, BW, and press Enter. Notice that when I do that, what I typed into C1 blocks the visibility of what I typed into A1. And as a spreadsheet designer, I would have to make a choice at this point. How important is it really for me to have my initials right at that spot? Is that critical? Do I actually need my initials there? Or can I move my initials somewhere else? Or could I delete my initials? It looks as if I actually deleted some of my title. But if I click back A1, we'll see that the whole title is still there. It's just that these annoying little initials got in the way. I'm going to go ahead and delete my initials. I don't really need them there. But I wanted you to see the effect of what that would do if I was trying to design a worksheet and I wasn't careful about where I was putting things. For now, I will, I've clicked on C1 where the initials are, and I'll hit my delete key, and now those initials are gone. I'll go ahead and type some more of my data. So here is going to be my income area, and my income sources are state funding, private donations, And we occasionally have fundraisers. And those are my income sources. So I'll get some totals on that. I need to know what my totals will be. Then I'll have an expense area. And my expense uh, sources are office supplies, food, cleaning supplies, and what we pay the staff. And I'll need some totals on that, too. Let me zoom in here. I want to make sure that this is really easy for you to see when I'm typing. I hope that's better, and I hope that's good for you. Now, remember back to when I put my initials in C1 and how that made it hard for me to see what was in A1. I'm going to want to put some numbers in this area here. Column B is going to end up with numbers in it. So this is going to cause me some problems. I'm going to have a conflict, a, a visual conflict, between the labels in column A and the numbers that I'll eventually want to type into column B. So I need to do something about that. And the way for me to fix that is to make column A wider. And there are two different choices. Well, actually, there's a lot of ways to make a column wider. But I'll show you the easiest way. Now. In the easiest way, there are two choices for that technique. If I point at the line that separates column A and column B, I point right at that line until I get a crosshair with a double-headed arrow on it. Let's remember that in a Windows computer, a four-headed arrow is for moving something. A double-headed arrow is for changing the shape of something. And I want to change the shape of column A. I want to make it wider. So I look for that double-headed arrow. Now, if I double-click that arrow, Excel will figure out what is the widest entry in a column, and it will make the column wide enough for that entry. So look at that. My title is obviously the widest entry, but that's maybe excessive, because I'm not going to have any numbers to the right of my title. And I do want my numbers, if I just type my numbers way over here, it will be harder to relate them back to the labels there. So instead of a double click, I can also just drag and drop. So I will, again, I pointed at that line. I got the double-headed arrow. And I can drag and drop until I'm happy with the column width and then let go. And now I have a nicely shaped column A. And column B will have the numbers in it, and they'll be very easy to place next to the appropriate labels. Before we do anything else, I'd like to save my work. So I'm going to come up here 
to the Save button on my Quick Access Toolbar. I'll click it one time with my left mouse button. Excel offers me a name. It offers me a generic name, Book One. I'm not, if I named this Book One next week or next month or next year, I would have no clue what was inside this worksheet. So I will call this the Shelter Budget. It wants to put it in my Documents area, and that's actually OK. I'll let it go into my Documents area. So I'll click my Save button here. Ah, it's telling me I'm about to overwrite one. Is that OK? And I'll say, yeah, that's OK. This is going to be my most current one. All right. We need to put in a few more text entries. So I will click at B3, and I'm going to type Jan for January. But instead of pressing my Enter key, this time I'm going to click the Enter check mark because I want to do something special with this entry. So I'll click the check mark. And that's just as if I'd pressed my Enter key, except I didn't move down. I stayed right on that cell. Now, we are doing a worksheet that is only going to be about three months. But for one second, let's imagine that we have a boss who asked us to do a five-year projection. And I had to type January through December five times. That would be sort of boring and annoying. And also, if you've seen the way I type, I would probably make a bunch of typos doing that. So it would be nice to let Excel help me with this. So watch what I can do. Every time I'm in any cell, I have this border. It's called a selection border. That's the border that shows me where I am. In the lower right corner of a selection border, there's a little square. There's a little dark square that's filled in. And if I point it directly at that, I'll get a crosshair that has no arrows on it. You have to be careful here, because if I'm up just a little bit, I get a crosshair with arrows, and that's for moving. But I don't want to move this January. I want to do something else with it. I want the crosshair that has no arrows at the tips. When I see that crosshair, I know that I can use that little box. It's called the fill handle. And I can grab that fill handle and drag to the right, and look what happens. It fills out the months for me. So the fill handle actually does two things. And the first thing that I'm teaching you that it does is it, it will fill in a series. So if I need to create a series of data, I can use my fill handle to do that. The months of the year are one series that we can rely on. The truth is that in my lifetime and in your lifetime, we're not getting any new months in the year. January through December, that's it, pretty much. So Excel knows that. And ex if I use the fill handle when I've typed in one month, Excel will fill out the rest of the series for as long as I drag to the right. I can also use the fill handle to go down. Let's do a little sample here, just so you can see it. I'll type Monday, and I'll click my check mark. And if I point at the fill handle, and I get that little crosshair, and I drag down, it will fill out a series for me based on what I started with. So you can use the fill handle to go to the right, or actually even to the left. You can also use the fill handle to go up or down a column. Now, I actually don't want that data there. So while I have it selected, notice I have a selection border now around that whole section. I'll hit the Delete key on my keyboard to empty that out. I just did that so you could see that a fill handle will fill a series to the right, and it will also fill a series down a column, if that's what you need. Now, I don't really need anything more than January, February, and March. I only put these months in there so you could see the fill handle at work. I drag my mouse across there, and I tap my Delete key, and now those months are gone. I want to take one moment here just to talk, talk about moving around a worksheet. I didn't uh, mention this before we started. You can, as you know, as you've seen me do, you can click your mouse anywhere you want to go, and you can move around a worksheet that way. You can press your Enter key to go down. If I hold down my Shift key and press Enter, I can go up. So Enter is down, Shift Enter is up. I can hit my Tab key to go to the right, or I can Shift Tab to go to the left. I can use the arrow keys on my keyboard keypad 
to move around up, down, right, left. If I hit the home key on my keyboard, it takes me back to column A. If I, let's click, I'll click over here. If I hold down my control key and tap my home key, it'll take me to the upper left corner of my worksheet. If I use control end, E-N-D, control end, takes me to the lower right corner of where I've been in this worksheet. So even though I don't have any data over here, I have clicked over here. So it took me to the lower right corner of my worksheet. That is sometimes helpful, sometimes not so helpful. But it's, it's something to try if you're trying to move around a really large worksheet. Um, I'd like to go back to my A1, so I'll click, I'll, excuse me, not click, I'll hold down my control key, I'll tap my home key, and there it takes me back to A1. So these are a lot of different ways that you can move around your worksheet. You can also use page up and page down. There are many different techniques for moving around. There's no right or wrong way. Some work for some people, others work for other people. You will find the technique that you like to use. All right, at E3, I'm going to click, and I will type the word totals because I want to get a quarterly total in this column. And I'm going to save my, click my Save button in the upper left corner of my screen on my Quick Access Toolbar. And now I'm ready to start entering some numbers. By the way, notice that I do have an Undo button. So now that I've been working, if I needed to undo, I could undo. And let me show you something else. On the Undo button, there's an Option button. And if I click that, I can decide how far back I want to undo. There's a list of what I've been doing. Notice it goes all the way back to my typing the title. These are, this is a list of all the things I've been doing in the past, what, 10, 15 minutes. So I can undo as far as I want. I'm not going to undo anything, though. If I did use undo, then redo would become available, and it would also have the same list. All right, I'm going to type in some numbers here. So 2,000. 750, 1,800. So these are numbers that I took from a previous budget, and I'm anticipating something similar for the upcoming quarter. Now, let me show you something else that Excel can do for us. If I click on this 2,000, my state funding is going to be the same every month. I don't have to type it for each of these months. I can type it one time, I can point at the fill handle, and I can drag to the right, and it will copy what I typed here. This is different than doing a series. It's a copy procedure. So if I type in a number, I can copy that number by highlighting it and dragging the fill handle either across or down. Um, if I want to get a series of numbers, I have to start with two numbers. Let me just give you a quick sample over here. I'll type the number 1, and I'll type the number 2. If I only typed the number 1 and used the fill handle, it would just copy the number 1. But now, because I've started with 2, I've indicated a series here. And now I can point at the fill handle, I get that crosshair, and I can drag down, and it will fill out this numeric series for me. But the difference between a numeric series and a text series for the fill handle is that I need to start with two, at least two on the numeric series. I don't really want that there, so I will delete those numbers. And I'll come back here, and I'll type in some more numbers. And 1420. And 90450. OK, so those are constant values. These are numbers that will not change. They will stay forever unless I change them. So if all of a sudden I realize that I've got a mistake on a number, I would have to go back and actually retype it. Maybe this is supposed to be 1320, not 1420. I have to actually click on the number and then either press my Enter key or click the Enter check mark to accept the change. So a constant value will not change 
unless you go back and change it yourself. Now, I also want to put in my expenses. My expenses are going to go into this area here. I want you to notice something interesting. When I highlighted this area that I'm going to type into, it all got shaded except for one cell. The cell that I'm currently in is actually that cell that is not shaded. If you look in the name box, it tells you that the current location is actually B10, even though I pre-highlighted this area. Let me show you the advantage to having done that. If I am now going to type some numbers, 150, and then the next one is 1,000, 275, 3,000. Watch what happens now when I press my Enter key. It stays within the selected area. So if I'm a data entry person, data entry is a job that requires a lot of attention. And very often you're reading from a sheet of paper on one side of your computer while you're typing. And sometimes it's handy to not have to worry about where your cursor is on the computer. This way I know when I've pre-selected those boxes, I know where my, uh, my cursor is going to go or where my selection is going to go every time I press my Enter key. It's very handy. If you do a lot of data entry, this is something that you might want to remember and try the next time you do your data entry because it can help you speed things along very nicely and you don't have to worry about the fact that you might be making any mistakes about where you click your mouse. Pretty nice, huh? Okay, I will click off to the side. So now I have my text entries and I have my constant value entries. I'm going to use Control S on my keyboard to save what I've done so far. And we are now going to start calculating. I will click at E4. And at E4, I want to find out the totals of the first three months of the state funding. And there's a number of different ways I could do that. I could type equal 2,000 plus 2,000 plus 2,000. Oh, by the way, I haven't mentioned to you yet that all formulas begin with an equal sign. If you don't type an equal sign, Excel will not calculate it. And so, for instance, if I type 2,000 plus 2,000 plus 2,000 and press my Enter key, look what happens. It didn't calculate. Excel will only calculate an entry if you start with an equal sign. I'll cl click back here. Up in the formula bar, I can actually edit up there. If I type an equal sign there and press my Enter key, then it calculates. So this is one way I could do this calculation. I could say equal 2,000 plus 2,000 plus 2,000. And I'm using Excel sort of like a calculator, and it works. It, it calculated for me. But then I'd have to do the same thing here. I'd have to say equal 750 plus 987 plus 1320. And I'd have to do the same thing here. That is too much work. I would much rather let Excel build my formulas for me once I've given it an example of what I need. So I'm going to go back to E4. I'm going to hit the delete key on my keyboard to get rid of that entry. And I want to point out to you on the home tab of your ribbon all the way over towards the right, there's a group called the editing group. And in the editing group, there's a button called the auto sum button. And I'll click on that one time. When I click on auto sum, Excel asks me a question. It starts a process, but it pauses in the process. And it's saying to me, I think you want to add, because you've asked to sum, are these the numbers that you want to sum up? And indeed, they are the numbers I want to sum up. So I'll click my check mark, and I get a result. Now notice down here, I see the result of 6,000, but my actual cell content is this formula. This is a prime example of what I was talking about earlier, that what we see down below is results. What we see in the formula bar is cell content. Now, the advantage to having done this, what do you think I'm going to do? I'm going to point at my fill handle, and I'm going to drag down through row 7. Even though I don't have any data in row 7 yet, that's OK. Now, Excel was smart enough to know that at E4, I was adding the numbers to the left. And at 
E5, I'll still want to add the numbers to the left. Same thing at E6, and also at E7, once numbers start to appear down here, this will change because this is a variable value. Watch what I mean. I'll click here at B7. I'll go back up here to the Auto Sum button, and I'll click on it one time. And again, Excel is asking me, I think you're adding. I'm pretty sure you're adding. Are these the numbers you want to add up? I want to caution you here that there are some instances when Excel is wrong. Don't assume that it's right every time, because sometimes it's not right. Sometimes it actually grabs the wrong numbers, depending on the layout of your worksheet. So you should always check it. I will go ahead and click my check mark here, and watch that zero turn to 450, because now this calculation that's adding up row 7 suddenly has a number that it can rely on. And I will point at that fill handle and drag across. And again, this number changes. So there is a lot that fill handle can do for you. It is one of the most popular tools that students learn when I teach Excel is that fill handle. It really can do quite a lot. OK, I'm going to do the same thing here. I will click at E10. I'll click my Auto Sum button. I'll check to make sure that's the right range to add. And then I will ch click my check mark to say, yes, that's what I want. I will point at the fill handle. I'll drag it down all the way through row 14. And then I will come over here. I will click at B14. I will click on the Auto Sum button. Again, I will stop and I will check to make sure that Excel is going to be adding up the correct numbers. I'll click my check mark button and then I will drag over to the right. And now I've got really a dynamic budget worksheet going here. I've got my constant values here and here. By the way, notice that I was able to select two non-contiguous ranges that way. I did that by, I'm going to do it again. I selected the first range. Those are my constant values for income. Then I pressed and held down the control key on my keyboard. And then I highlighted the constant values for my expenses. This is handy if you, if you want to do something to those two areas. So let's do something to those two areas. I think that one thing that would make this worksheet easier to read would be if I put borders around those numbers. So in the font group, there's a border button. And if I click the selection option but arrow on the side, I can say I'd like to have every cell surrounded by a border. And now I have little borders around those numbers. Let me show you the payoff for that. I'll go to File come down here to print. And here I get a print preview. And notice that when you do a print in Excel, you don't see the grid behind your numbers unless you request it. I mean, you can print the grid, but generally speaking, most people do not because it's an eyesore. But this makes these numbers a little easier to read if they're identified with those borders around them. So that's one reason I like borders. OK, I will come back here to the worksheet. And I'm going to re-highlight these numbers again. Well, actually, I'll tell before I re-highlight those numbers, let's talk about how these numbers look. These numbers are in what is called a general format. On the Home tab, in the middle of the Home tab of the ribbon, there's a group called the Number Group. And there's a lot of different ways that numbers can look. Numbers can look like currency. They can just look like a raw number. They can look like dates. They can look like time. They can look like fractions. They can look like percentages. There are many, many different ways that we can format a number to change how it appears to us visually. Now, at the moment, we're in what's called the general format. There's nothing special about the general format. So for instance, if I have a number and I type let me retype this number again, 1320. If I type 1320.00, and then I press my Enter key, I'll still just get 1320, because the general format does not show percentages 
record does not show decimals, sorry, the, f the general format does not show decimals unless you need them. So that 1320 went back to 1320 even after I typed the point zero zero because it's not necessary to express the value. It only shows decimals if you need to see decimals to understand the value. So up here in the formula bar, I'll type 0.75 and then press my Enter key. And then look what happens. All of a sudden, I've got decimal values showing here because I need them. I won't understand this number if I don't see those decimals. But that also changes the way my worksheet looks. All of a sudden now, if we imagined that I actually had more numbers than what I have, it could start to get kind of jumbled. And visually, it could be difficult to read. Whenever you are building a worksheet, you have to think about who your audience is. Are you building this to go to a meeting with your coworkers? Are you building this because you want to go, for the go to the board and ask for a raise? Are you building this because you want to go to the bank and get a loan? Why are you building your worksheet, and who's going to read it? And you often have to think about legibility. What will make things easier to read? So we can change the way numbers look. I, again, will highlight these numbers. This is, those are my constant values for my income. I will hold down the control key on my keyboard and highlight the constant values for my expenses. And up here in the number group, I will point at this button that is the comma style button, and I'll click on it one time. And what that does is it makes all those numbers, now they're similar. They, they appear to be a similar, they are in a similar format. All the numbers have decimal places, whether they need them or not. And the numbers that are larger than 999 have commas. These are called comma separators. When you are typing numbers into Excel, do not type a decimal unless you need it. And do not type commas ever, because some people will type a comma in the wrong place, and then that number turns into text. So instead of you typing a comma, use your formatting skills to place the commas there. Now, to make this really nicer to look at, I need to format these other numbers, these totals. So I'm going to use that same skill about selecting non-contiguous ranges. I'm going to highlight one area. Then I will press and hold down the control key on my keyboard. It's important that I do that after I highlight the first area. Then I'll highlight another area. Then I'll highlight another area. And then I'll highlight another area. And now I can do one action to all those numbers. And this time, I'll put dollar signs on them. I'll click my dollar sign there. And now I have given these numbers an accounting format or a financial format, a currency format. I'm very glad this happened down here. I want you, you see those pound signs? That's not something to worry about. The pound signs simply mean that I have an entry that's too wide to be seen in the column. This is the way numbers deal with that. We already learned what text does. When text is too wide for a column, it just spills over into the next cells if there's room there. But numbers don't do that. Numbers don't spill to the left or the right. Numbers turn into pound signs if there's not enough room to see them. If I click here on D14 and I look up in my formula bar, my formula is fine. I, don't I do not have an error in this place. Instead, Excel is just alerting me to the fact that the number is not visible because the column's not wide enough. And this is a time when double clicking would be work really nicely for me. I will double click, and Excel figures out how wide it needs to be to show that number. I'm going to save my work. And we will do one more row of calculations, and then this tutorial will probably be done. I will come down here to A16 and type in one more label, net gain loss. So I know I want to be able to show the board members which months we expect to be OK, that will come out uh, on top of things financially, and what months we might be in a little bit of trouble. So I'm going to do that with a formula. This time, I'm not going to use a function. Here, I used the sum function. Functions are pre-built formulas that Excel 
makes available to you so you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. But sometimes we do have to reinvent the wheel. Now, you may remember that I said that all formulas begin with an equal sign. So my first keystroke will be to type an equal sign. And what I want to do to figure out gain loss is I want to subtract my expenses from my totals, uh, from my income. So in order to do that, I have to start with the income. So I will type equal, and I will type B16. Then I will subtract from that the total expenses in B. That's a mistake, not B16. Betsy, what are you doing? My total income is in B7. And I will subtract from that my total expenses from B14. Glad I caught that. Notice the little visual cues that Excel is giving me here. It's pointing out to me the fact that I am using this cell and this cell in my formula. And if I want to see a positive number when I'm OK and a negative number when it's a loss, I have to start with the total income and subtract the total expenses. I will click my check mark. And I see that I don't lose money. I come out ahead $125. That might not be a lot, but it's still, it's not a loss. And up here, again, I, s I see a result on the spreadsheet. I see content in the formula bar. And my friend, the fill handle, is going to come in here. I'll point at the fill handle, and I'll drag across to the right. And now I'll see that, well, maybe that first month is OK, but I'm in some trouble for the other two months of the quarter. And for the quarter itself, I'm in some su substantial trouble. So I'm going to have to show this to the board. And we'll have to talk about how to project other sources of income, probably. Think about that. So I will click my check mark. And for now, I'm going to stop this tutorial. In the next tutorial, we'll talk about building charts and graphs and formatting our worksheets a little bit more. Thanks for visiting. I hope you enjoy.